Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John. And welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies both new and old with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right. And to avoid any lazy negativity, we are making this a drinking game. A what? Drinking game. A drinking game. <laughs> any negative criticism That's is okay. absolutely allowed, <laughs> but you will be called out for it and you will be forced to take a drink. You will hear this incredibly luxurious sound. Mm. That means we're... <laughs> Jesus. That means we're that drinking. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. <laughs> and we hope that you are as well. <laughs> so pour yourselves a glass, get some tape for John's mouth, and uh, oh. join us and give it up for the films we love. Perhaps the films that need some love. Oh my gosh, people. It's cabbage. <laughs> what are we John, you can't this heckle week? us. This is oh, our wow. this is a joint podcast. There's three of us. You can't just fucking heckle right off the bat. Also note there's going to be a parental advisory because we're going to be telling John to go fuck himself a lot this episode. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about films from the film year 2012, which I would say across the board was a pretty, pretty good yeah. film year. Uh, mm-hmm. But before we get too deep into it, let's send it over to John for some quick shout outs. Shout outs. Shout outs. As always, we're going to give it up for the beer sponsor. His name is Mr. Carlos Barroso. You can follow his handle on Instagram. That's cbarrozo bar 2019. That's C B A R R O Z O B A R 2019. And as always, the music you hear on this episode and every episode is provided by the artist Dasein. That's Dasein, D A S E I N. You can find all the music available for free downloads at soundcloud.com forward slash Dasein dash artist. All right. Mm. Jeff, back to you. Film year 2012. That's what we're talking about, people. We chose three films, including one that is in our redemption category, or was it really that bad? Although I will say this week, usually because this is a drinking game, we try to choose one that, you know, we're going to really have to drink shitting all over. But we made it, we made, I think these are three we were, pretty. I, we went more films. controversial with the. Uh, yeah, we went more, con- we went yeah. more controversial. This is more of a solo where it's like, let's give it another look now that we've had some time. But we're going to talk about them. In a second, but we wouldn't be a newsworthy film podcast if we didn't send it around the horn and talk about what we've been watching and maybe some news we'd like to share. So, Dave, why don't you kick us off? All right. Uh, I've been, I've been, I caught uh, Netflix's Warrior Nun this week. Uh, it's kind of like... Warrior Nun? Warrior Nun, if Buffy was Catholic, as I call it. Oh, my God. Um, it was, yeah, it's... it's uh, it's is actually it quite... A, it's, it's quite an entertaining show. It's, it's, it's quirky. It, it really okay. is a lot like... Uh, Buffy similar in tone and stuff, but uh, yeah, they uh, they drop the occasional cuss word and stuff. But she uh, mistakenly gets in inducted into this order, and she's not meant to be there. She's actually dead, and they put this thing in her because someone's attacking. They have to put it somewhere, and it brings her back to life. And hilarity and action ensue. Uh, wow. it, it, we we binged the whole thing in like three days. It was uh, wow. we actually got really caught up in it, and of course, Star Trek Discovery is back. So I caught that yeah. one this week. Nice. Yes. Also, did you hear Tenet, on... Tenet lost the number one spot to War with Grandpa? <laughs> yes. <Yeah, I saw laughs> that. yeah, yeah. That's some bad Tenet news. What was the number? What was the number? <gasps> I, I don't know. I didn't even look it up. I looked, I looked at what it lost it to, and I'm like, no, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> 20 people. That's why the infections rate are back up again. Yeah. Um, I mean... One of many, right? Jesus Christ. Awesome. All right. Uh, Dave, Dave, do you think the Warrior Nun spun off because of what show is it? Umbrella Academy? Or what show is it where the there's a woman who's a. She's a nun. And it's like a. One of those shows with like superhero people. That's the Flying it, Nun. And no, I don't think no, it was no, spun off it, from that at all. What was that? Is it Watchmen? <laughs> no. Al Pacino. Al Pacino. That show on uh, last year on Prime where he has like a group of cohorts. Oh, what, what's yeah. the name of that show? Anyway, I, I thought you would have seen it. Sorry, it doesn't matter. Mm, All right. Dope. So this week I watched, after our uh, discussion on Bride of the Monster, directed by Ed Wood Jr. last week, I sat down last night and I watched Tim Burton's Ed Wood. Yeah. And I felt like an asshole for us <laughs> making so much fun of that movie that I cannot recommend this one enough. It's a movie about movies. So that that is, if you like movies, I think you're going to be a sucker for it anyway. It's great, set in old Hollywood, cast. shot in black and white. The cast is incredible. Martin Landau is so good. Johnny Depp is so endearing. It was so sweet. His Still relationship hurry. with uh, with Bella Lugosi was so touching. It was it was so touching. Uh, definitely recommend that. Um, that was a wonderful watch. The next night, I was still feeling it, so I watched um, James Whale's Frankenstein from 1931, oh. mm. which was awesome. 
Um, the next night, I watched uh, <laughs> a documentary feature and called then? one was called The End: <laughs> The Final Days of the Obama White House, which was pretty cool. It was okay. Um, and then I watched Gods and Monsters, which is a movie about James Whale. It's a I think it was Ian McKellen's first yeah. nomination as a lead actor. Um, that was a cool small movie. They don't really make movies like that anymore, like really intimate stuff. Um, just a few characters. Brandon Fraser was in it, probably not great, but Ian McKellen was really good. Um, and then uh, I watched that. I don't know if you guys saw any promos for this, but I watched uh, The Way I See It, which was about Paul Sousa. I don't know if anyone follows him on Instagram. He was mm. the White House photographer for Reagan and for Obama. And he has a very famous Instagram account um, where he just posts tons and tons of pictures from his time, mostly with the Obama administration, kind of in response to Trump's bad, you know, tweets. Usually he'll tweet something and Paul Sousa will put a picture up with a witty caption underneath it. Like, oh, yeah, well, this is how I used to get done kind of thing. It was a it was very like, oh, you know. Very political. I thought it was going to be more like, this is what White House photography is like. It ended up being very political, but it was still touching. And of course, we're living in crazy fucking times. So it was refreshing to see somebody who cares. And then last night I watched, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the HBO Max put out a one time like West Wing special where they kind of reenact one of their famous episodes. Um, uh, Hartsfield Landing which is one of their most famous episodes where it's talking about the town of Hartsfield's Landing as the first town in America to vote. They voted 1201 on the night of election. And it had all the actors getting back together and putting it on stage at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles. There's some like promo stuff in between talking about voting. It was pretty cool. Very mm -hmm. political yeah. week. What are you going to do? I'm also working the polls coming up, you guys. Nice. Give it a shout out. I'm working Ooh. early election all next week and I'm working yeah. election day. If anybody's not registered to vote, don't be a fucktard. Register to vote. Watch your movies. <laughs> Jeff, what'd you watch fucktard this week? Fucktard indeed. Fucktard. Um, I, we started watching, um, I, I don't know why we're on a Netflix, like do whatever Netflix says kick. So we started watching um, The Haunting of Bly Manor. I, I'm a mm. sucker for trying to be a part of relevant things, like current things. Like I'm not going to watch a show from four weeks ago because the conversation's lost, I guess. Um, Bly Manor is good. It, I don't I don't think it's great, but it is one of those shows that we keep we keep watching. And I am kind of compelled to continue um, even though I, I think it's demo, it, it like refused to just go for it. Cause I feel like they were like, but what if some kids are watching? So I wish they just kind of gone for it a little bit, a little, a little too much polish, but again, it's fun. And supposedly the eighth episode is great, whatever. Anyway, so is it as scary that. as, um, like no, the Hill answer is House no, kind of no, thing? the answer is no. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see what else. And then, um, we watched the, oh, I watched the documentary about BTS. <laughs> Shout out to fucking BTS, guys. BTS is the real deal. They are so successful. I I really, I knew, but I didn't know. BTS, K-pop um, group. Yeah, fill me in. Who the fuck is that? <laughs> Why am I, I'm just not surprised, everybody here. I'm going to represent <laughs> the, the younger folk. Uh, BTS is the most, uh, the Actually, most. I just want to jump in. I, I know who they are. Oh, okay. BTS, thank you, Dave. <laughs> BTS is possibly the most successful like boy band group of all time, even more so than Insane. I mean, they they have records, every, every record, YouTube streaming in twenty four hours, Spotify streaming in twenty four hours. Um, I mean, they are so in demand. Their song "Dynamite" had five hundred million views in the month, like it, ridiculous numbers. This is this is the this is the group on TikTok that was so huge mm. and trolled I, Trump. I can't I can't wait to find out that they're actually AI generated and they're not real at all. They're so real. <laughs> they're so real. They they preach with love. They anyway. They're they're a great group. So I watched I watched a documentary about them. They are fantastic. They're so so great. And their management company, their manager, the manager of the group, Big Hit Entertainment, just IPO'd at over four billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's how uh -huh. successful this group is. Their manager's net worth is $4 billion Can, in the majority of the property. I've that. set it on a couple of IPOs and they usually go for about an hour. Could you imagine the IPO for this one? They just sat down and went, we got BTS. The, the funniest thing Done. about this it's and part of the reason, $4 part of the reason, <laughs> yeah, 4 billion. And each yeah. of them each got $15 million in a month because they got um, an ownership share. Anyway, um, we, we can't talk about BTS anymore. So I watched last <laughs> two nights ago, we got in a pumpkin carving mood and we watched the original Halloween so Dave, save your announcement for after I'm done with this little bit, but I'd never seen the original Halloween, the original Mike Myers story, 1978. Watched that. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna withhold any thoughts or opinions until next week. More on that later, Dave. And then we immediately watched Annabelle because I had seen all of the um the Conjurings and and it's the same family, the Warren mm. family. Although Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga are not in this film, although I have a feeling they were asked because they are mentioned. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah, we're working the family, the Warrens. And I was like, oh, fuck, yeah, we're going to see Patrick. But nope, they just didn't do it. It is good. I wish they didn't show the demon too early, but like Annabelle's good. But we just wanted some scares. So we watched that and that was cool. Um, I have a feeling I'm missing something, but I feel like that's a good chunk there. So hmm. uh, that's it. Not a lot of news except for Ratchet on Netflix. Got 48 million views already. And it came out like Holy two shit. weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, Netflix. Because oh, yeah. it's all worldwide on Netflix. So 48 million. Yeah, I said this before huge. when I was talking about... Um, Al- alone or a- away with a um, Hillary Swank space drama. Everything oh, yeah, yeah. Netflix is doing is for the international viewership. And my, my only news is also Disney is taking note because they basically just said, you know what? We're not worried about COVID. The Mulan thing works. We're fucking going for it. We're, 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 we're all in on Disney plus. Except, so, except for Marvel films. Yeah. 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 For sure. They're going to, they're going to pretend like they're all kind of separate and stuff. They're going to still try I, to do that. Yeah, but... not, like I was having this discussion today and I don't think they can make the billion dollars they're making from a streaming, like a streaming release. Unless they start selling our data. Uh, not that, you know what I mean? Like there's, mm. there's, they're going all in on Disney plus. They want to get everybody hooked the same way. It's going to be Netflix, HBO. Uh, we'll, we'll see what other streaming services Did anybody see possibly hang Mulan? with them, but... Nope. Did anybody pay thirty dollars on a streaming service that I no, already paid for? So no, I, I don't do know that. anyone who's seen it. That's kind of surprising. People with to me kids. That's... that's the thing about Disney yeah. Plus. Parents, you need. If you're a parent with young kids, you you need Disney Plus. You just need it. You can download and you can watch them in the car. You just need it. You need to have the app. So they're going all in on it. And you know that's it. They laid off all their workers and they they said we're sorry, but we're going for streaming. Anyway, Disney um, is not a sponsor of this podcast. Just to... <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, some of our previous comments. That's bloody obvious. <laughs> Dave, do you want to do you want to tease next week? It's the week after, dude. It's the week what's after. The, what's bro. today's date? It's kind Today's of like the halfway 18. through. Yeah, we 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 are coming up though. Uh, when when we uh we hit oh the uh, holiday season uh for Halloween, and we thought, well, what can we do that's kind of special? So we're on Halloween night. We're gonna try and do this show live. Yeah, with video live streaming on the facebook page on facebook live uh yeah completely uncut uncensored we've got our lawyers on standby <laughs> mark zuckerberg uh, is gonna <laughs> shut us down dude we talk way too much shit about facebook no. to make this work. <laughs> it, dude it, it it takes it takes three weeks in the senate inquiry for mark zuckerberg to delete a post so i think we're good true we just again <laughs> We're throwing shade even when we're trying to defend it. Oh, come on. God, that's um, funny. Yeah, we so don't yeah, so mark your calendar. That's going to be we, fun. We're also going to have some special guests who really know their Halloween movie stuff, unlike me, who had never seen Halloween before. So we're very excited about that. So we have two more weeks for that. So excited. And I'll tell you what I thought about Halloween, the original Halloween. Then. Is anyone terrified about going live? <laughs> uh, a little scared. A little uh, nervous. Yeah. yeah, sure. A little bit. Nah, Might feel a little different fun. out there, it's gonna be, it's but gonna it's going to be great. Cool. We're excited. Well, we should get into it, people. We're talking about the film year 2012, unless anybody has any other final thoughts. Uh, there no? was a couple, right, just one, one quick thing. There was a couple of news stories that were discredited this week. Um, oh, great. Tatiana Maslany is not She-Hulk. What? I just Marvel saw that series. today. Yeah, no, apparently she's said that discussion is not happening. Uh, and oh. we uh, there is no discussion at the moment between Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield to appear in Spider-Man 3. Okay, yeah. yeah um, so was, they discredited mm. that as well. But take that as you want, because sometimes the studios leak this stuff to get an opinion. Uh, uh, yeah. It right. could be true, it could be not. We don't know, but they were discredited. Oh, and that's back to the Disney thing, where hmm. they're, they're so all in. that They're now saying, oh, but they're taking the multiverse effect. So mm-hmm. all of the seven Hulks and the, the four Spider-Man, they're like, oh, multiverses, they can easily... Disney is willing to go serialize it, go serious. Like they're willing to figure it out. They don't give a shit. They're doing it. They'll mm. do whatever they want. All right. Cool. So 2012. <laughs> I, I I imagine you know what the number one box office, the number one film at the box office was in 2012. Is it your Did favorite you guys... Dark Knight movie? <laughs> no, that was number three. Ah, damn it. <laughs> okay. Um, one uh, of the highest grossing films of all time. Hobbit, Hunger Games. All right. Is I'm going to go ahead. In, in okay. game. 
No, what, Endgame. What Endgame came no, like two years Avengers, ago. Avengers. Yes, Avengers. The original Avengers, one point five billion dollars at the time. It Wait was like bit. number three on the list of or number two, maybe at the time, two thousand twelve. Number two on the highest grossing films of all time list in two thousand twelve. Um, right now, it's number eight. So the Avengers, one point five billion. Then you had Skyfall was number two with one point mm. one billion. The Dark Knight mm. Rises. Yeah, you could you can listen, have Jeff some fun and movie. listen to one of. <laughs> Go go back to like episode seven or something where we talk about the Dark Knight trilogy and just I just there's just like two choices that really <laughs> yeah well just, what were they very no we, we don't need to no no oh no, no, no. To just <laughs> they they thought that the fans were stupid anyway um the <laughs> Hobbit the an unexpected journey one point zero one seven billion dollars so those are four billion dollar movies two thousand twelve but then you have Ice Age Continental Drift. Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2, which is the final Twilight Saga film. The Amazing Spider-Man with Andrew Garfield, $757 million, which apparently was not good enough to get a fucking trilogy. Then you have Madagascar (laughs) 3. Hunger Games at number 9, which The Hunger Games actually is the first film to have four weeks at number 1 since Avatar. And one of the only films ever to do that four times in a row. And now, of course, those hmm. numbers are different with fucking uh, in this year, Invisible Man and, and Tenet and shit, but whatever. Okay. And then Men in Black 3, another shitty film at number 10 with 624. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, right. Okay. This is actually, there were a lot of great films. I love this Men year. in Black 3. <laughs> All right. A lot of great films this year. <laughs> Um, but let, let's let's look at the Oscars because actually this is we, we only do the Oscars because it is a historical tent pole. So sometimes we can take a look. And you know what? This is a very interesting Oscar year, including one of my favorite, if not what I consider to be the best Oscar acting category of my lifetime. Are you ready for this? Well, first of all, Argo wins Best Picture, despite Ben Affleck not being nominated for Best Director. Um, other Best Picture nominees, Amore, which was amazing, and Emmanuel Riva probably gave the performance of the well maybe the top two performance of the year in Amor, but it's a foreign language film. And so it was never going to win anything. Beasts of the Southern Wild, really fun (laughs) debut. You had Django Unchained from Quentin Tarantino, Les Mis, which did not age well. You have Life of Pi with Ang Lee, who won Best Director, his second such award. You have Lincoln with Steven Spielberg, Kathleen Kennedy producing. Steven Spielberg was visibly unhappy when he did not win Best Director, even though looking back, that was the correct decision. Sorry, Steve. You have Silver Linings Playbook and mm. Zero Dark Thirty, which a lot of people thought was going to be a front runner until there was some controversy and the Academy Awards got scared of controversy. Aw. All right. So um, <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis wins for Lincoln. He beats Bradley Cooper. Joaquin Phoenix in The Master with fucking Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh my gosh, that was such a good fucking movie. And then mm. Denzel Washington basically single-handedly carried flight into the Oscars categories. Jennifer Lawrence wins for Silver Linings Playbook, even though she was like 23. She beats Jessica Chastain, because again, controversies. Kovanja Day Wallace was nominated at 11 years old for Beasts of the Southern Wild. But here's my best category, because I don't need to talk about the Oscars all day. The best category here, best supporting actor. All five pe- people had won before. They've all had an Oscar. Christoph Waltz wins for Django Unchained. I think there's category fraud there. He probably should have been considered a co-lead with Jamie Foxx, but whatever. Alan Arkin was probably never going to win for Argo, but you get De Niro coming back with Silver Linings Playbook. But the bang bang of Tommy Lee Jones and Lincoln and Philip Seymour Hoffman in The Master. I mean, that's just a good category. That's just a really, really good category they don't see every day. Um, And then let's see. I'm going to quickly go through some other ones. You had A Born Legacy. You have Expendables 2, Hope Springs, End of Watch. Perks of Being a Wallflower, I really like if you like your your YA movies. Taken 2, and then a lot of big fuck-ups. So you had John Carter fucked up. You had Battleship fucked up. You have Cloud Atlas fucked up. Rock of Ages fucked up. And That's My Boy, really fucked up. So that's five big fuck-ups. And then for kids, <laughs> good year for kids. So you I have... passed it five times? <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> Kids movies, Lorax, Brave, Wreck-It Ralph, Mirror Mirror, Snow White and the Huntsman, Beauty of the Beast gets re-released in 3D, Hotel Transformation, Frank and Weenie, Magic Mike, Ted, 21 Jump Street, The Watch, Pick per- Pitch Perfect, This is 40, and shout out to films that we've talked about on this podcast, A Royal Affair, The Cabin in the Woods, Think mm. Like a Man, Moonrise Kingdom, anything else you want to shout out now that I just listed 50 movies for these people? Oh God, no, we've got to move on, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about- That was Magic almost as long- 
as the Oscars. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oscars hosted no, by I'm Seth glad, MacFarlane. I'm glad you did that. That's good context because this was a weird year. It was, it was so crazy. You had mega films. You had mega films that lost a shit ton of money like Battleship and John Carter. You had a lot of really good kids movies. So it was a good year for kids movies. And then the Oscars is going to be remembered for fucking Argo and Lincoln and Life of Pi, right? It's weird, yeah. but um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. The Master, I think, is going to age well. But we're going to talk about Looper, Ryan Johnson's film, which basically got him a Star Wars film, right? He had done other movies like Brick and um, uh, whatever the other movie was that he did. Um, but Looper was his big movie. That was his sci-fi like standout. Mm. Wrote and directed, movie. yeah. Yes, written and directed. Um, shout out to Knives Out, which I thought was a fantastic film last year, one of the best films of 2019, which is Ryan Johnson's return to auteurism. Then we're going to talk about The Place Beyond the Pines, which if for whatever reason it's unfamiliar to you and you're still listening to this podcast, we're talking Ryan Gosling, Bradley Cooper, Ava Mendez, Ben Mendelsohn, Dane DeHaan. We're talking about a really, really, really good cast. Yeah. Mahershala Ali. So stick around for that. And then we're going to do our redemption section, the controversial film, Prometheus, which also has a ridiculous cast. And this is Ridley Scott back at the helm doing another alien movie. More on that later. Shall we get into Looper? What do you say? Yeah. Hell yeah. All right, here's the pitch. 2024, the mob wants to get rid of someone. The target is sent into the past where a hired gun awaits. Someone like Joe, who thankfully is... Joseph Gordon-Levitt, so he plays a character named after himself, right? Um, so he is in 2044. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is in 2044, and the mob from 2074, 30 years later, will send people back, and he is basically an, he's basically an executioner, so he kills them and disposes of the body in exchange for gold, and lo and behold, Bruce Willis, who is actually Joseph Gordon-Levitt in the future, gets sent back in time. He sees himself, decides not to kill him, and that is the movie. There you go. The assassin who refuses to kill himself. The sci-fi thriller written and directed by yeah, Ryan Johnson. I don't know if he decided to take it from- not to kill himself. I don't think he had any say in it, really. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, right, that, went, that went to hell. Talk, uh, talk. What do you think? Uh, this this is one I, I like. This is probably my ninth three watch of this one. I, I come back Whoa. to this regularly. God damn. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's just, it's fun to watch. And it's it's funny because uh, everything you need to know plot-wise is explained to you in the first two minutes. And uh-huh. then it's just mm. settle in. It's, I really, I really dug the way it's written. Um, this is, as you said, a Ryan Johnson film uh, that's before he turned evil. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually thought this is uh, the movie that's the future if we reelect Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody register to vote. Continue. To <laughs> um, yeah, the one, uh, one. I mean, one of the things I I love and I didn't really pick up on before until I read it, like an IMDb note about how uh, Gordon Levitt really watched a lot of Bruce Willis films to capture young Bruce Willis and. I didn't notice it on these early rewatches, and but you can see him literally doing Bruce Willis's facial expressions and his mannerisms, and it's done so well. Yeah, this is definitely a movie that <clears throat> I think it's it's almost more obvious because it's an action movie, and we're so used to uh, to a very digestible structure with successful box office hits and action. So I don't know if anyone you know. Not everybody reads articles and stuff going into this, but I think everyone had kind of heard that this was kind of an unorthodox action thriller sci-fi kind of thing when they were going into it. And I had mm. not seen Brick yet when I saw this, so I didn't know who this guy was, but I knew that he wrote and directed it. I was like, okay, so I kind of had an expectation that it was going to feel original. But this is it's almost more obvious when you're watching this genre that good acting, <laughs> as well as an original voice <laughs> with the writer and the director, is really what makes this movie so unique. I, I think this movie with with lesser talents, Emily Blunt is wonderful yeah. in this. Mm. And, and so is obviously so is Joseph Gordon Levitt and Bruce Willis. Um, so you kind of it's not that you there's no forgiving because you're celebrating the whole time. It, it's very entertaining the whole time, but it's things like that. That Ryan Johnson knew if Joseph Gordon Levin doesn't pull this off, we're dead in the water. Yeah. Um, immediately, this movie is going to fail as soon as people realize, oh God, he's a young Bruce Willis. 
So they also did, um, I kind of want you to talk about if you have, I have a feeling, you know, what did they do to his face, Dave, with his it was eyes prosthetics. and prosthetics. He had prosthetics on. Did they do anything to his actual irises? I, no, not as far as I know. Um, it was okay, mainly prosthetics like around the face to like mimic the structure. Hmm. But yeah, he, uh, they may have the changed the color. The little vocal affectations, the little fall yeah. off with the vocal fry over the over the larynx was like just very Bruce. You know, just those little like one liner things, the falls, like all that stuff adds up. We often come back to this on like what makes the, the, the work good from a director's standpoint or an actor's standpoint or anyone in between. And it, it's like the details. Well, there are a million little details that Joseph Gordon Levin had to work on so that that would be believable, so that you could actually enjoy this this kick ass story. So uh, yeah, hats hats way off to him because, yep. I think they marketed it as young Bruce Willis. I think they showed you that on the trailer and stuff. Like it's we kind of knew that going in. So like everyone was kind of like, you know, sitting there arms crossed. Like mm. let's see if he can pull it off. But anyway, now that we've said I mean, that, to bring it to bring that's back not to the why writing, this movie is so amazing. Yeah, like go the back writing, to the writing. Um, it's it's uh, and I'll I'll bring this up again when we get to um, Pines because I had a little bit of trouble with their shift of protagonist in that film but in this one i think it's done beautifully you don't actually know what's going on at first but they literally live his entire life like it it goes from gordon levitt through to bruce willis's time showing the aspects of his life up to that point and then from that point it shifts to him as the protagonist for a while and i thought that was a really clever way of shifting the focus onto we're going to follow his story now like his his latest Mm -hmm. story i really dug that Jeff, what do you think, man? How many times it's, have you seen this movie? It's funny. Dave keeps it. This is a couple of weeks in a row where Dave takes all my notes. Um, <laughs> well, I, I wrote I wrote at the top. I said, I'm, I'm actually looking it up right now, but um, I wrote, I love the exposition at the top. It's um, the guy who I'm, I'm fucking it up. Waiting. So the Waiting for Godot playwright, Beckett, Samuel Beckett, mm-hmm. has said the audience of a play will give you 15 minutes. So he doesn't understand why people wait on exposition. The better thing to do is just give people context. They signed up for the play. They're ready to go. And I think this movie does that with a voiceover of Joseph Gordon-Levitt at the very beginning. And also, I've talked about this in the podcast. Sometimes you just have to play to the trailer a little bit, right? So, of course, Bruce Willis being Joseph Gordon-Levitt, they're the same person. That's going to come up in the trailer. And the majority of people going into this movie already know that. So rather than try to make that the reveal, just fucking tell us the exposition at the bat. We know Bruce Willis is coming. We get it. And then that's part of the movie. That's part of that's part of the film. It it sets up the story, but it's not the whole story. So they still have stuff left for later. Because here we we are on a movie podcast and we know that after this becomes Bruce Willis's movie, there's still 40 minutes left, 45 minutes left in the movie, if not more. And then it becomes about the Rainmaker which is a character that we'll talk about in a second. But um, here, here's, what I, here's what I will say, and this is not a critique, but this is definitely something as far as who to refer this movie to. This is a sci-fi movie. It is in the sci-fi genre. Everybody can love this movie, but sometimes we just have to accept that this is definitely a movie for movie people, especially so. It is digestible by other people, but I wrote down a couple lines where it was like very much somebody that has sat in many dark rooms by himself for many hours writing scripts clearly wrote this movie. (laughs) There's a lot of times where it was like, this is a very blatantly attempt to, in one sentence, lighten the mood because we need some humorous, you know, context in order to get through the scene. And there's like a lot of these like, personal exchanges that are are very scripty like things that you see in movies a lot but not in real life having said that there are i I wrote down the the bruce willis backstory switch was brilliant um the idea of closing the loop because when you introduce a sci-fi element like time travel there's 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 baggage that comes with that and Mm -hmm. i actually wrote down i loved that so joseph gordon levitt and bruce willis confront one another obviously that's going to happen and Joseph Gordon-Levitt starts asking him questions about time travel, which as the viewer, you're going to start asking yourself, what happens if Joseph Gordon-Levitt dies right now? And this movie doesn't run from that, but it almost gives off the impression. I, I really think Ryan Johnson is so smart that he's playing with the audience a little bit that Bruce Willis starts banging on the, t- the table and he, he gets out of answering these questions really, really well. And he's like, this isn't my future. I can change the future. Why can't I do this? Why do I need to matter about this? And finally, Bruce Willis is like, stop it with these questions. We There's more important things going on. And you're like, <laughs> and it's a, it's a funny way of dodging these questions. Like, it's, it's really clever and it's really, really humorous. The sci-fi stuff is great. 
He does pull it off. And then by the time you get to the, I wrote down, this motherfucker is the rainmaker, <laughs> which is the first time that the kid <laughs> like has like a reaction or anything. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, I just think it's great. I love the Paul Dano scene, um, which again, it's like, dude, why do you run to your one friend? Of course, they're going to follow you to Joseph Gordon-Levitt's apartment. But the thing I like the best, this is what I like the best. I love when movie makers are not too precious with their protagonists, because sometimes definitely like the actor director syndrome is that the actor writes themselves into the role that they want to play so much that um, they make them so perfect and clean and polished. I'll use the stars, the stars born as an example. Bradley Cooper did not dirty up that character enough. He should have made that character a piece of shit, Um, but he was playing it anyway. This particular movie, Joseph Gordon-Levitt rats on his friend. He's a rat. And I love that about our protagonist. I love that he is an untrustworthy, self-serving kind of... Are you kidding me? I get the gush. I get the gush on Looper. I can't believe I get the gush after I just said this is clearly written by a guy who sits in a room by himself all day. <laughs> anyway, but yeah. And, and of course, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, 2012, he was coming out of 500 Days of Summer, 50-50, The Dark Knight Rises. Like he is on a, He was on a tear at this point inception so anyway kudos kudos mm. i i do love the film but i would love to get into the rainmaker segment soon unless you guys had more to talk about before we get there i think my only this is, i've only seen this twice and i remember really appreciating it the first time i saw it i and i think i said things like that was really cool i don't think it like touched me the way it touched you dave but i remember like having nothing but praise for it watching it a second time you know, knowing the story and knowing the twists and kind of being able to watch it through the filmmaker goggles a little bit more. I think the only thing that it's not even a, it's not a really a critique, but I think he could have, if he wanted to, he could have leaned more into the style that is suggested with the, the lingo and some of the, the scenarios, but the way like the mob handles stuff and the way, uh, the way the world is apparently presented in some regards is not realistic to naturalism, and some of it is. So mm-hmm. that threw me just a little bit that like there were still scenarios like half the movie takes place in a very realistic, naturalistic setting in Emily Blunt's farm, and the other half does not. But I don't feel like that was intentional that like cities are different than rural life. And because he starts it with such a stylized, almost noir style voiceover. I was kind of expecting it to be much more stylized. And I think my only critique is that the di- uh, the dialogue does feel like it belongs in a more stylized film. Um, Interesting. Th- I don't know. It's, it's, it's not, it's not a mean, negative I, thing, but it I, did kind of, that movie thing you're talking about, Jeff, like sometimes it feels like you're watching a movie. Yeah. I think I would have minded that less if he had stylized it more to just lean into the fact that, yeah, this is absolutely a movie. We're not trying to be... Realistic. Yeah. It felt Transformers. Yeah, it I, felt I'm not I mean, Transformers. Terminator esque. It felt Terminator. I, I say I've seen this nine times, but it's. Uh, I think half the reason I've seen it is to look at it and go, "All right, what what happened here?" Because, yeah. like I said, I like I like the writing in this. There's so many "What the fuck is this now?" moments. Like when she runs inside inside the house and jumps in a safe, and you're like, oh, "What yeah. the fuck is that?" <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah, you really. But I like. I think it. It's a really good journey up to a point, but I, yeah, it doesn't really stick the landing and kind of leaves you a little bit off, I guess. But but I it, think it's almost like it outsmarted itself. Maybe. Maybe, but I still can't tell. And I'm curious. I'm here. I don't know. It's interesting hearing you say that because I kind of the second time I kind of told myself like, that's how you're supposed to feel. Like he doesn't. He wants you to feel like you're kind of caught in the loop with this movie. That like nothing is going to be totally resolved because it it's always kind of pulling the rug out from underneath you. And I never got the, I've personally never got the feeling that it, it was constantly trying to, to be one step ahead of me. Shout out to Chris Mm. Nolan. You guys know I love him, but sometimes I get on him for, sometimes I feel like they are trying to outsmart me all the time in his movies. I didn't feel like, like Ryan Johnson was trying to outsmart me. He was having fun keeping me on my toes. Yeah. I think there were a bunch of little details that ended up, adding up into something that was much more than itself it, it never felt like it was a device driven movie oh to me. absolutely early early on there is nothing that's revealed that's wasted but then you get yeah. up to a point and like when he first like blurts out the the thing to emily blunt and she's like oh you're a looper mm-hmm. and the rest of the movie i'm like how does she know mm-hmm. i think they, we're led to i think we're led to believe it. but i think we're led to believe though that other loopers may have run into her farm, don't you think? So Emily Emily Blunt lives on a farm, and Joseph I mean, Gordon Levitt's trying to escape. Definitely has a vagrant problem. That is true. Maybe, but that, but that is kind of exactly what I'm talking about. Like 
that's almost like a Blade Runner kind of thing. Like you talk about loopers like they're this really famous thing that everyone knows about. And yet Joseph Gordon's Levin's Joseph Gordon Levin's character at the beginning didn't really present it that way. So in a naturalistic world, which her world was was natural, it, it kind of seemed I don't know, it, that did seem like it was a bit of a stretch for for people to know about things like that if the world still ran the way it was and he apparently operated in the underground crime world. So there were yeah. things like that that kind of I wanted him to squeeze it just a little bit more because I felt like in every other aspect he did such a good job of creating a very um, insulated feeling. A lot of this takes place in in very insulated settings. This isn't a super yeah. broad thing where they go all over the world. It takes place in his apartment, a couple of different locations, and then a farm. And then you cut away to Bruce yeah. Willis every now and then. But they would have dialogue that referred to the rest of the world. That kind of pulled me out of it just a touch. But again, I it sounds negative. I really I like this movie a lot. I think everyone should watch it. It's very, very, very yeah, unique. Me too. It subverts it subverts the genres that it falls into by being a little bit more wry. I feel like there's a there's a humor that he has in his writing that all those actors handle brilliantly. Yeah. And there's a humor in the way he direct he directs action, which I also really appreciate. And mm-hmm. he gives you the, the the juice when he needs to give it to you. When you finally get to the Rainmaker's reveal, which we know we're about to talk about, he has a very tasteful way of doing that. So he also has, he has a range in the way he directs action, which I know you don't like his Star Wars movie, Dave, but I can understand why they were attracted to him as a director. <laughs> Actually, you know he's... what? It's the same with Looper. As I go back and rewatch that, it's growing on me. Because I can... The, you get, that you get... moment you're talking about? No, no, I'm talking about uh, Star Wars because I don't like his, his Star oh, Wars yeah. film. As I go back and rewatch that, that's growing on me. I think that's his style. Like, you separate you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not going to get it all in the first in the first watch. You've got to go back and see this a couple of times to include all the like get all the subtlety. I think he does that on purpose, or whether it's his style or what. But I think that's which, a Ryan which, Johnson thing. Yeah. I mean, you'll notice I'm, I mean, I'm no longer referring to him as Ryan Dream Smasher Johnson. So you know, that's good. That is a big step. <laughs> we just want to give Jeff, uh, Dave a round of applause for that one because that's a big step for him. Jeff, get in there. If 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 episode eight was a standalone Star Wars film, there's something there. There's something there. But he had the problem, which John Boyega has been outspoken about for different reasons, and and I I can't speak to any of the behind the scenes stuff. But the the character we, we just didn't really need him, and they they didn't know how to get him back the way that they got Han Solo back. They just didn't figure that out. But Ryan Johnson doing like a single this looper's smaller than i thought to be uh, to your point john where there's less going on it's more intimate and so you really get into these people more i thought it was going to be more like episodes one two three of star wars not to keep using that canon but where everything is city-like and there's uh, there's like hmm. there's just set or, pieces or, non-stop or actually right? maybe over, maybe, yeah. maybe more blade runner too but just like huge sets and more care and even though we don't see them even if they're all cgi they're there but this is really like you could count 20 people that you know their faces by the end of this film um yeah and i thought that and paul dano shout out to him he has this, like two scenes and he's pretty damn good in them and jeff daniels is the villain i think jeff daniels does a uh, fantastic my, job especially favorite, with the humor my favorite, the favorite line, line in the film is jeff daniels wait it's don't like, wait uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna guess because we have the same notes okay when he goes what are you doing learning french you want to go to paris when you leave you should go to china and it's like i want to go to france and he's like i'm from the future you should go to china that's my favorite line in the film yes yeah. dave get on get out of my notes <laughs> Get out yeah, of my nose! What are you guys doing? I I'm left from, out. I'm from the future. You should go to China. <laughs> it's pretty fucking funny. <laughs> yeah, so um, true. But anyway, to, to episode eight, the, the worst part about it was like, oh, it took away all the season se- episode seven. All the, forget about all that stuff. He knows how to tell a good story in like, a, especially a good like l- like small scale story with the audience. Watch Knives Out if you haven't watched it yet. It's like three days and it's fucking mm-hmm. fantastic. Anyway, he's he's very good at the. You can see. Where he came from with Brick going to this and then... And Brothers Bloom. He did the Brothers Bloom in between. Brothers Bloom too. And I have not seen that one. But um, you can tell he's also... I've listened to tons of interviews with him. And I just... Ryan Johnson is a huge fan of film. The TV episodes. All the TV episodes. Breaking Bad. Ozzy Mendez has a 10.0. It's Mm -hmm. the second to last Breaking Bad episode. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the guy knows what to do. He's very... He's clearly very intrigued and interested in, in... Kind of that thing we were talking about with Billy Wilder, like the hook, like he's really good at keeping an audience engaged. So we've seen him cross genres now and still yeah. maintain that kind of style. And just as a as a person, um, he does a really he does a lot of moderating at the Directors Guild. Mm-hmm. And he does he like does a lot of their interviews, and he's he's such a fan of the medium that it's kind of hard not to find him charming just because he loves it so much. Oh. 
But I think he's going to be one of those that, even though he had a start like so many people with a, a couple independent films, a lower budget action film like this, and then he exploded, you know, with Star Wars. I think years from now, once he does a lot more, we're going to, I think he's going to just get more and more praise and we're not going to maybe judge him for the context that he was that he was pimped into by directing one of the major Star Wars movies that probably changed his entire career for for like five, six, seven years. I think Knives Out got him out of the hole. Yeah, not my But I feel like for a long time he was still he was still stuck there. I remember when he was talking to Denny Villeneuve and he was interviewing him on Blade Runner 49. And of course, they had a few moments where they were like talking about just the terror of taking people's dreams from childhood and just doing their own thing with them. And just the fact that he has the bravery to continue trying it and then follow it up with a movie like Knives Out in between Mm -hmm. this movie. I don't know. I think it says very loudly he's more than competent. I think he has a really unique voice. He's fun, which, you know, you guys know I like my serious auteurs, but like (laughs) I can take him seriously, even though I know he's having tons of fucking fun with the camera. He's having tons of fun with the script, which I respect enormously. I'm always going to be entertained. And I know that when I go see his movies, I'm going to be able to bring a friend who doesn't love the same shit that I do. I think we're both going to be entertained. Yeah. So. One of my favorite mm. moments from last year is when Christopher Plummer, Christopher Plummer is sort of the, the, he's the central figure in Knives Out. And when he finds out that he took something that might kill him, his, uh. re, his reaction is like, sometimes you just hit the sweet spot. You know what I mean? Especially when you're in charge of the setup. And everything, it's you know what I mean? There's no context going into a movie like Knives Out. I think the same thing about Looper. We have no context other than the trailer and that opening exposition. Yeah. And he sets you up, and then he says, okay, but this is, it's actually, it's not a time travel movie about, like, exploring that necessarily. It's actually, is it about love? Is it about loss? Is it about power? Is it about, he introduces the TK, which is the telekinesis, basically, or, but it's, it's actually, you can lift objects, basically, which is, he even says it's like a worthless trait. And so is the, it's, he's like making fun of sci-fi tropes, but then it becomes mm. a central thing yeah, in his that film. Was, that was a little red herring there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Let's talk about that fucking little, kid. Little let's bit go of mis- there. Misdirection. That kid fucked me up. Let's talk about it. What were you going to say about that the, kid was so the Rainmaker? Good. Yeah. He was so good. You were gonna, I feel like you were going to say something, Jeff, and then you kind of saved it earlier well, no, because Did you have anything specific? I, I, don't, I don't know how to set the audience up because the whole movie, the pitch is Bruce Willis and Joseph Gordon-Levitt in meeting, and then there's Emily Blunt's farm. But Bruce, basically, they, they need to... It, it's, it has, the Terminator entrance is, is chosen by me because it's it's the terminator it, it's what it is bruce willis is going back in time to kill somebody from the future that's why he's back that, that that's sort of the giveaway the, so this is another ryan johnson thing it's not he's not just coming back to to escape he's actually coming back for a purpose right mm-hmm. so it's not like oh joseph gordon levitt couldn't kill his future self well why is bruce willis back here it's like well he's an outlaw okay fine but really what he's trying to do is kill a kid it, it, that's the terminator right except this, instead of killing a woman it's no oh, the terminator too is kill a kid right I don't fucking yeah. remember all those timelines, but yeah. yeah. So this is, he's coming back. The first one is woman, second one is kid. He's yeah. coming back to kill a kid who in the future is a, a powerful criminal. And, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt has the task of being like, well, maybe I should protect this kid from myself in the future. And that's a really fucking interesting conundrum to be in that I didn't think an hour before because I hadn't started this movie yet. I didn't think that's something that would consume me. And now here's Ryan Johnson, who sets he he gives me the exposition. He sets this thing up on a platter, and then makes me care about it. And now I don't know if I want this kid to live or die. And I think that's something that only somebody who really knows what they're doing can can pull off. So that's and I, I don't, don't think... have much to say about the Rainmaker. On top of that, the kid's awesome. I love the violent outbreaks. He probably should die, but uh, like I don't know. <laughs> and I like that he. All right, this is kind of a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Sometimes I think he I knew what he was doing. Because sometimes he would play into action movie structure tropes, but he would still subvert it in a way. So the first time Bruce Willis has to kill a child, of course, if you're a normal human being with any kind of empathy in your heart, you're already conflicted just by what's happening with the structure of the story. You're like, oh my goodness, he's going to do that. That's fucked up. And he has to do it. He does it. And you're like, that's fucked up. And then he has a moment where he like leans under some fucking highway and they go in for lots of close-ups and Bruce Willis gets to have a very serious, you know, breakdown. Mm. And when it's happening, you're like, okay, sure. I'm just need to see the humanity, but spoiler alert, just in general, I'm not going to say exactly what happens, but if you haven't seen this movie, just skip the rest of this. Cause I don't want to give it away. But if you, 
if you don't take that scene seriously, and even if you feel a little bit like, come on, kind of how I did the first time I saw it, where I was like, I know what you're doing, but like, I'm already there empathetically. If you don't raise the stakes on the issue with the humanity of this character, you will not have the payoff of what happens at the end with the child that ultimately becomes the Rainmaker. So it's almost like he subverted two different genres at once by he didn't need to have it in there for the action thing because we've already have that Terminator trope in our head. We could have just mm -hmm. watched him do it and he could have let us do the emotional math for ourselves. But by putting that scene in there, he surprised us when we actually had to confront something evil as a child later. So it wasn't just the idea of killing children. It was, we had already taken on that, that role as a murderer ourselves, also, also, dealt with it because we empathize with Bruce Willis. And then when Bruce, when Joseph Gordon-Levin is dealing with it, I'm still not sure. I kind of want to ask you guys directly. Do you think when he finds the child in the cornfield, when he realizes he's the rainmaker, do you think part of him was still considering killing the child? When he, yeah. do you not see where I, he, where I he goes so. in there and he puts his arm around him? Do you think he had totally given up? On the idea of like, I can't do this. I I think he was set in that he wasn't going to do it. The thing I do want to bring up is like that, that scene you referenced where he kills the first kid. And then you have that moment of humanity where he's like leaning there and he's, you know, having an emotion. And then suddenly it's like, all right, where's that second fucking kid? It's it's like he snaps straight back into mission mode. <laughs> it's like, I, I, oh, yeah. oh, I feel bad. I feel bad. Oh, wait, still one more kid to kill. Hang on. Off we go. Yeah. The and movie it, must continue. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, we have to continue too. This has been yes. a fantastic, fantastic journey. Looper is on stars. Yeah. Looper yeah. is on stars. It's not exactly streamer. a good version that's on the stars. Like the, the compression quality of that. Did you get really bad compression quality artifacts in that cornfield? No, I was fine. Okay. All right, cool. Must've been just mine. I didn't think about it. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't notice anything. I mean, it really it's highlighted that like the, the shot in the cornfield when he's on the bike riding through the cornfield. And I'm like, mm. wow, that's when the effects ran out of money. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Get out of here, Dave. All right. So that was Looper written directed by Ryan Johnson, Bruce Willis, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Emily Blunt, Jeff Daniels, Paul Dano. Watch it on stars. We are coming right back with the place beyond the pines. Ryan Gosling, Bradley Cooper, come back. See you soon. Film fans. We're back. We're back. Yes. <laughs> Long All right, people, we had to talk about. We had to talk about Looper. We just had to, we had to do it. Um, yep. And my introduction for the films of 2012, which again was a pretty good year. So you know, sorry, but thank you for giving me some rope. But we're now about to talk about a movie that I imagine not many of you had thought about very much in the past couple of years. Um, but it aged very well. And let me get this cast here. So just to get us back into oh, the context yeah. of 2012. So 2012. So this is the year of Silver Linings Playbook with Bradley Cooper. This is also the year of Hangover Part 2 for Bradley Cooper. So he had done mm -hmm. Limitless. Um, you know, he had done a couple other... F he, he had been in movies, but he is now definitely a star. <laughs> and so you have Ryan Gosling and him. That's the selling point right there. And then you also have Ava Mendez, who is pretty well known. I had never seen Ben Mend Mendelsohn before this movie. I had never seen Dane DeHaan before this movie, who you may know from um, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. He was Harry Osborn. You may know from... Um, he, was, he, was, he had a cameo in Lincoln, and he was in Lawless, and he's been around. He's really, really good. Um, was this the Emory start of Cohen. Ben, Mend ben Mendelsohn's renaissance? So, cause he, like, it had to have been, because he got everything he, now. He definitely got um, he definitely got Bloodline from this, which he ended up winning an Emmy for for season two on Netflix. Bloodline starring Kyle Chandler, um, where he basically plays like the evil brother, but not the evil brother, but he plays like the troubled brother who comes back when the family parent passes away. Sam Shepard. Um, but yes, this is the beginning of the Ben. This is Ben Mendelsohn as a villain and Ben Mendelsohn creepy and everything. This is this is the beginning of it. And he's awesome <laughs> in this fucking film. Yeah. And he's not a villain in this movie. He just he's a bank robber who thinks another bank robber is a quote unquote good guy, which is something I'd never heard of in a movie before. He's like, who is how is my dad? Oh, he's a good guy. Wait, he was a bank robber. <laughs> like I'd never it's just uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The cast is unbelievable. Mahershala Ali 
I had never seen. I, I guess this is right around when um, House of Cards. Uh, House of Cards came out, 2012. But he, Mahershala Ali, um, Ray Liotta is in this film. You have Emery Cohen, who would be in Brooklyn Rose later, Byrne. and he's in the OA. Yeah, Rose Byrne plays Bradley Cooper's wife. Ridiculous, ridiculous cast. Okay, it's hard to. I don't even want to read the IMDb quote, so I'm going to do my best here. here. Here's what it is. It's three acts. It takes place in Schenectady, New York, which is the place beyond the pines. Schenectady, New York, kind of in the middle of nowhere, outside of Poughkeepsie in that area, um, and Troy and Albany. Um, they So act one is Ryan Gosling, who is a motorcycle riding carny, who does those little motorcycle. If you've ever been to a, a carnival show where they have the sphere where the motorcycles ride up around it, and it's just a crazy carny show. And then he realizes that the year before he had a fling with Ava Mendez that resulted in a child. So he decides to stay locally to help take care of the child. But Ava Mendez is now dating Mahershala Ali, who's helping take care of the child. But Ryan Gosling wants to be a good father to take care of the kid, but he just quit his job at the carnival. So to make money, he meets up with Ben Mendelsohn, who's fucking awesome. And the two of them rob banks together. And they do it in a very, I don't want to say tasteful way, because there's but as tasteful a way as possible to, to rob banks. It's a really interpersonal way where you as the audience are kind of torn because you might actually be rooting for Ryan Gosling to rob this bank to take care of the family. <laughs> the end of... The act segues because he, as a bank robber, runs into the law and the police officer who comes in contact with Ryan Gosling is Bradley Cooper. I'm going to skip the spoilers for the preface. So Bradley Cooper is the second act. So after he catches the bank robber, he becomes a hero in the cop community. But he is incredibly guilty about his new role. And he sees the other members of the police force um, ripping people off and taking drugs, for instance. So he becomes somewhat of a rat, sort of stitches on his community a little bit and leverages his information and this hero status for power, leading to Act 3, which is 15 years later. And Bradley Cooper is now running for district attorney of, uh, well, the federal district attorney in New York. And his son and Ryan Gosling's sons are friends, sort of. And that's act three. So you have Ryan Gosling as the motorcycle outlaw, act one. Bradley Cooper as hero cop, act two. And then their kids with Bradley Cooper running as district attorney, act three. It is surprisingly profound, very intimate, very cinematic, very beautifully shot, great score, great music. Derek Chian France... Is that how you pronounce his name? I hope that's how you pronounce his name. Written and directed. And I think I'm going to leave it there. Who wants to take it where I left off? Well, as usual, I kind of want to ask this question. Dave texted us in the middle of the week. Dave, you had never seen this movie. And I think your text said something about it being a bit of a head trip if you didn't know what you were getting into. What did you mean by that? I mean, I well, I I read the uh, IMDb synopsis, as I often do, because sometimes I browse through the trivia while I'm watching. It's fun um, and can give you little tidbits. and I read the synopsis, and the synopsis of the film is not the movie you're about to see. It's right. in there, but that is like the first third of the movie you're about to see. And I wasn't actually ready for that. So when like the end of the first act happens and it shifts, I was a little jolted, and I got really pissed off. And I was like, "What? Like what the fuck? That just pulled a total left turn on me, and now I'm you know I've got to follow." this character and Wait. and but oh yeah that went away so it was it was like really jolting and again it's one of those things where i think it might have been intended um mm-hmm. and i'm i'm sure they didn't advertise it in this way when it was uh in theaters but uh yeah there's it it the first switch where they switch into with well, the first act switch i guess is i found really kind of jolting yeah mm-hmm. i think uh yeah. I think Jared John friends, this is a, <laughs> all right, I'm going to go to bat for this guy. He makes movies that don't get that. We don't like movies that get made this way anymore. This movie did Shots not get out. celebrated in the Academy Awards. It didn't get nominated for fucking anything. Um, and then when I think when people watch this movie, they're like, why didn't this get nominated for anything? It seems like a movie you should, that you should take seriously. 
I think he likes. We know who Ben Mendelsohn is because of this movie. Yeah. Like, let's be real. Mm. I think he likes to. Uh, I think he likes to play with with structure in an interesting way. Uh, this one is very obvious with with three acts. It, it is a unique experience. You feel like you have these very long three acts. Maybe people haven't seen a movie that's done in that style anymore. Probably it's not long. recently yeah. by any means. But Blue Valentine also feels that way. I thought the light yeah. between the oceans or whatever that one's called um, also yeah, had a, a different kind of thing. You listen to him in um, in interviews, and he always talks about how he is most attracted to movies that it's usually drama, and it usually creates. It's not a. It's not a a quote movie where you kind of go see it and you kind of move on with your life and you like it or you didn't like it. He said he likes movies that you have to live with because they are experiences. They are intense experiences that will never leave you. And I think it's obvious when you watch something like The Place Beyond the Pines that you may have never seen anything like this before. And you might even feel like there are some things that don't work perfectly. But the the level of experience that it achieves, I think is honestly... All the movies that are up there uh, in the Academy this year, I think the only other one that I think gets to that level of experience is The Master. I did not feel this way mm-hmm. in Lincoln. I did not feel this way <laughs> in Argo. I felt like I was watching movies when I watched those. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But in terms of an intense, serious adult drama, especially with tragedy, mm. which this is this is a tragedy. Oh, this is like yeah. the, the, the alternative he, title of this should have been a series like, of really bad fucking choices. This is like six tragedies. Yeah, <laughs> it is a lot of tragedies, but it's still... I, I thought let me try to let me try to phrase this correctly. I think he takes the structure of tragedy, which is introduced in Greek theater, which is it's 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 not unknown. Like we we've seen a lot of people try to pull this off. So he uses some pretty uh spectacular and almost cliche tropes along the way of how to to build more tragedy as he's transitioning from act to act. And yet he has this very specific American spin on it. There's this Americana, this poor lower class that transcends into this upper class. So you kind of get the whole gamut of what it feels like to approach a more average Joe kind of life in America because it takes place in Schenectady. So even when he gets to the richer part with Bradley Cooper at the end when he's doing really well, even though he's running for the district attorney in New York, you never leave Schenectady. You know, you don't go to Manhattan or anything where he or Albany. You don't you don't go anywhere like that. So it still has this very a uh, specific cultural context, which I think adds to it a lot. So oh, every time I see this movie, I feel like I'm watching an epic, which can apply to any culture and you know anywhere around the world. We've seen a million wonderful versions of that. And he told an American version of it, which I haven't seen done in a, in a really long time. One version is The Master that came out this year. So I think it's also cool that they both came out at the same time. I think we also have to talk about the fact that like this guy had only made one really successful movie before this so to kind of further my point that people don't really like movies like this nowadays he made Mm. a student film in 1998 that apparently won the jury prize and was nominated uh, at florida film festival which is a very large successful film festival especially in 98 it was people paid attention to it and he was nominated for best feature there and no one bought the film and he disappeared and he did some tv documentaries and things like that he didn't get a film made until 10 years later when he finally got to make uh, Blue Valentine. That was, was that 2008 or 2010? 10. 10. 12 years later. Also, it, came out, on, it actually... came out on Valentine's Day. So how fucked up is that? Yeah. Oh. So here's the irony. I this is all I want to point out. He points out, he, he apparently got praised for that first one, but buyers were like, this is too dark. That, that student film, this is too, no one wants to see this kind of thing. It's just too much. His style was too, it was a lengthy film, kind of similar to this for a student style film. I think he makes Blue Valentine. Granted, Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams are in it, two well-known actors. They definitely get the word out. He had some relative success. And then, Jeff, going back to what you're saying, and then this cast is his next lineup. Clearly, yeah. the people in the industry, especially oh. the actors, are like, this guy knows how to tell human stories. I want to be involved with this. The camera has no problem patiently following around humans directing behavior. So... Not to be that broken fucking record, but I talk about this all the time. I feel like this movie could have been made and would have been 10 times more successful in the 70s. Yeah. I think we are living in a time where this guy is going up against the grain. And it's so it's refreshing to me. I don't know about you guys. It's, is it refreshing or is it annoying? Well, refreshing's 
I, I'm we're, I'm happy the movie got made. Obviously, <laughs> obviously. Um, actually, it's funny. He's I, I, there's a little bit of trivia that he he met Ryan Gosling in 2004 in six. So Ryan Gosling wanted to be a very serious actor, but you know he's known for Remember the Titans in the Notebook by that point. So it was really hard for him to sort of break that mold. Which you know we we've all had worse problems in our life than being you know the guy from the Notebook, <laughs> but. Um, you know, Ryan Gosling was still Ryan his, Gosling problems. Yeah, he, he's he's had he had the 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 um DiCaprio syndrome, or he was like, "Damn it, I'm just seen as this beautiful, wealthy, successful young guy. What do I do with that?" Anyway, so that's part of the reason that he did Blue Valentine. I know how he feels. Yeah. <laughs> and then he gets Michelle Williams. Michelle Williams nominated for an Oscar, and and to be honest, Ryan Gosling should have been nominated for an Oscar for Blue Valentine. He, they, they were the two of them together were so good in that movie. But um, yeah. Oscars don't matter here. Um, this movie. We we have to we have to be honest with everybody and say that this is not something that you can just casually turn on and love for two and a half hours. It's long. It's not short, and it is it's pretty intense. But it, it's also very slice of lifey. So um, the opening of the movie. Here, here's what I'll say. Let me get. Let me let me stick from like an outer view before I get too deep inside the in, inner weavings of the characters and stuff. It has three acts. The first time I saw this movie in theaters, I was so into the Ryan Gosling storyline and I loved Dane DeHaan, who I'd never seen before. Um, and I tried to see him in a play so fucking badly before this movie came out called The Aliens, which is actually where he got signed by CAA and he became a huge thing, which is how we got a cameo in Lincoln. And I didn't need the second act, which is the Bradley Cooper storyline, which is funny because this is Bradley Cooper's year. Like this is the year that Bradley Cooper becomes the NA list star. Well, an A plus star. Um, and this time watching it, having seen the Ryan Gosling story play out in my head, because this is definitely a movie that snippets from this film have come back for just randomly. This happens in movies, right? All of a sudden you're walking through your house and you're goes, Hey, this reminds me of this movie. This movie it comes back for whatever reason that this time watching it, the Bradley Cooper one really struck me. It really, really, really did. Me too, dude. But, I felt the same way, but from the opening moment, Ryan Gosling's in a trailer. He has a ton of tattoos. He he's Ryan Gosling, so he looks the way Ryan Gosling does, which is you know attractive man. And then he walks. Handsome Luke. And then <laughs> it's called, of course, it's handsome Luke. I, I was gonna say that too. Um, depending on how into this movie we got, there are a lot of like times where it's almost like the, this director is also really good, similar to Ryan Johnson, but. Anyway, I'll get to that. I'll call back to that in a second. So he walks and it's a wonder where he's basically walking while smoking a cigarette through a carnival ride, hops on a motorcycle and then goes straight in a cage. There's a little sequence where it's obviously not him in the cage on the motorcycle. They, they can swap them out pretty quickly, but it's basically a wonder. And it's so intimate and it follows him right from behind so that by the time you get to I wrote down these motorcycle chase sequences where they where he robs the bank. Like the first time he robs a bank, he throws up afterwards. And I was sitting there and I was like, thank God, like him throwing up was a release for me because I had so much pent up emotion watching this incredibly real. It's not glorified. The only other movie that I've seen do a bank robbing sequence like this, and there are a lot, it's not Bonnie and Clyde. It's actually, um, um, what was the movie with the two brothers with uh, Ben Foster? Oh, uh, and um, in Texas uh, with Jeff Bridges. Yeah, come back to me with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's like the only time I've seen like a very simple bank robbery like this and then he gets on the, the motorcycle and drives 500 miles it's so fucking well done ben mendelson is so good in this movie hell or high water, hell or high water. i agree with you dude and also then very realistic. i loved it so then 15 years later when you watch the kids the spawn of this this you have ryan gosling who is perpetually a, a, a you know white trash and then you have bradley cooper who is Especially, I, I definitely in 2020, it puts a new scope on this, you know, and, and the villain in this movie is white. So, so it doesn't exactly have the perfect like 2020 like build up. Not that, you know, we need that necessarily. But um, th th let's just say there's a lot of qualified immunity going on in this police force. And a lot of police can do whatever the fuck they want in this movie, in the act two, the Bradley Cooper act. So that when you see the kids, you know, you see the one that is just fulfilling his father's legacy and the other one who is just forced to fulfill his father's legacy I, I i think it's it's just really powerful i i don't i don't know where else to go from there somebody take it from me and I'll, I'll come back um i mean there's there are a lot of uh um because i watched this with my wife and she referred to echoes mm. Mm. and it's it's like just, history repeats yeah. but it repeats slightly differently for like they flip the perspectives yeah. and stuff like that there's a, a massive sins of the father theme yeah. carrying through this whole thing um there's not a single performance that's not brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Like, 
everyone is phenomenal in this film that it doesn't nothing suffers yeah yeah oh i think it's also the uh, go it does, oh, I would it, ju- it does I- really go to some fucked up places though. yeah i was actually gonna say this about emory cohen who the first time i saw this movie um he puts on a really thick long island accent and he's basically like playing a bro and, and he was the only that was the only person in the movie that seemed like they were putting on an act but he's a fucking 17 year old in a new school so of course he was putting on an act but for some reason the first time i saw it i thought the actor was trying too hard and then in this time watching it he's like hey yo bro like the school's boring and then the next line is dane dehan being like i thought you were from long island and he goes why do you think that and he goes because people who talk like you come from long island and they're like like emory cone actually brilliantly nailed this kid in high school trying too hard that i i mm-hmm. honestly it got me and i I've, I've seen a lot of movies and i try to be you know as affluent as possible in this lingo and and no, he got a, me anyway sorry I, I cut both of you off whoever wants to take no no, no, no that's I mean, a that's a perfect example that i think it it's uh it's fluid through the way all, all of it the filmmaking the way it's structured cinematography and the way it's written and the way it's acted i feel like there are a lot of examples that are that's a really good one you think you know what movies are. And then someone makes a movie like this and they challenge you. And obviously he meant to do that. Like some people might mind that, that they think, God, this guy's trying really hard to make a very serious movie. So you kind of kind of put your serious cap on. You got to go in for that experience and take it seriously. But Jeff, I'm agreeing with you with everything you're saying, dude. You and I saw this together for the first time, by the way. Do you remember that down at the uh, was, Sunshine was, Cinema in Delancey? Yeah, for sure. Wait, wait. We saw really? that I the thought first it was, weekend it came out. I thought it was downstairs at, at Lincoln Square, but I can't remember. I think, no, I think we saw it at uh, Sunshine. And then I saw it again a few years later. And I remember you and I talked about it because I think you had seen it recently. And I was saying the same thing. I was like, if he cut out that second act, this movie would be brilliant. And then this time I watched yeah, it. I just, and I totally let all of it go. Mm-hmm. And... For one thing, I love Bradley Cooper is is wonderful in this movie, mm-hmm. uh, even if you feel like there are some things that aren't completely necessary from that filmmaker, like storytelling hat. If you again, if you let all that go, it, it, it doesn't matter. You're just in this this world with these people that takes place over these 15, 16 years. And you have an experience that's unlike anything I've seen recently. I, I can't remember the last time I had a really long, lengthy, dramatic, tragic experience like this. And the fact that. I don't know if it's because it's so long. I don't know if it's because he achieved everything else. It's probably all of it. But the fact that he can take a simple concept, like bookending the conflict and tragedy of destiny, and pull it off so that when Dane DeHaan rides away on that fucking motorcycle and becomes, you know, who he's supposed to be, or or who, who he's not supposed to be, rather, who he's becoming his father... I, I don't know. I just feel like it, it takes something that is this overtly sincere and egregious to actually make you make you feel that way. I don't know. What are you guys talking about? You guys are fucking with me. I just, <laughs> trust this fucking guy. He said, <laughs> "Just like, gotcha. literally texted gotcha. this guy. Yeah. I, I, we're talking yeah. too much. Yeah. Dave, talk to us. My, my finger, my finger was definitely on the trigger. <laughs> um, a, a couple of points. Uh, you watched this on Stars, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um. This is, and this is one argument where like we are a cinema podcast and we do enjoy going and seeing things at the cinema. This is one where I feel like this should be seen on a screen, not on a streaming platform, because I don't know whether you noticed, but stars cropped the fuck out I of it. I noticed that. A 1.78 res- aspect. It's shot in 2.35. I, I noticed that. And appa- all apparently the time, a, lot of the, a lot of the streamers do that. Let's are you listening to it. me, streaming services? Go fuck yourself. Stop messing yeah. with people's aspect ratios. They do this for a fucking reason. Just just make people deal yeah. with it. Yeah. And I, Buy a like, bigger I TV. Know, I noticed, Sorry, I noticed <laughs> halfway through and I looked up the tech specs and I'm like, this was shot in 235. Because half a lot of the shots, like yeah. sometimes they're half off the side of the screen. I'm like, surely they didn't shoot it on like that. On stage, no. like they told Emery Cohen to go and go on stage. And I was like, where is this kid? He, they just told him to go on stage. And I was like, where is he? And then he like finally sneaks in out of the oh, side. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? And I was like, he's definitely on stage at the end. Anyway, sorry, Dave. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And I must I must yeah. admit, I had a, I had a couple of jokes ready for like when, when I first started watching this. Because like I, I was like, yeah, we're going to make some jokes about this film. And... The jokes all went away as we yeah, got into it because it's like yeah, this stopped being funny real fast. I have a couple. Fast. I have a, but I have a, I have a couple. The, the only one, the only one that survived was he took the announcement that he had a son. Well, considering there was a motorbike on standby. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but right. that, that's the only joke that survived watching this film. It is a hard watch, but it's like I 
like I said before, it, it threw me and made me angry and stuff, but I I enjoyed it. Yeah. I, there's not a single thing I didn't enjoy about watching this film. Like it made me, yeah, like feel stuff. Yeah, that mu- yeah. the music too, which it, is why we do the this. music is very mood based, but it definitely like you talked about the echo. There's this droplet effect in the music where they go like doing doing. That's like they play a lot throughout the movie. That's really, really great. I did write down some jokes. The first thing I told you guys this already, but the night after I watched this, uh, Ben Mendelsohn haunted my dreams. He actually was the villain in my dream. Um, I remember I had to hide a friend of mine in my house in New Jersey. I don't know why I was in New Jersey, but I was like, oh, quick. Ah, shit. And it turns out it was Ben Mendelsohn coming after us, which is funny because, again, he's not a villain in this movie, but he just... God damn it. Uh, what, what's another yeah. one that I have here? Oh, Bradley Cooper, um, he's on leave because he gets shot in the kneecap. So he has to work from home. And he says, I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand working from home. So really 2020, right? Hey. <laughs> and then I also said- so um, timely. Ray Liotta and the guys show up at Bradley Cooper's house and try to take him out to go steal some money off of some immigrant families. Um, But he shows up and Bradley Cooper and Rose Byrne say, are you guys hungry? We have dinner for you. And I wrote down, if four full grown men show up to my house and I have enough food to feed them, I'm a wasteful chef. That's just all I said. (laughs) If I have a family with just Rose Byrne and Bradley Cooper and they have enough for four more humans, what the fuck are they doing? Why are they doing this? Quick. Quick thing on Ray Liotta, he played that as well, like well as well, because he was immediately oh, yeah, we didn't unlikable. Immediately yeah. unlikable. Yeah, 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 for sure. Immediately and unlikable course, and totally good. I, I, I mean, I'm going to go there. I'll draw comparisons. The second half of this film, I will, or like the second act of this film, mm-hmm. I'll draw comparisons to The Wire. Yeah, that's good stuff. Just, that's good yeah, stuff. Dude, it's it intense, like and it's yeah, it's. And I mean, it's a police drama. It's yeah, it's. But again, what I think, I, what I think touches me so especially about this film is that. Jeff, I know you've read it. Dave, I know you are a constant mm-hmm. reader like me. We're huge Stephen King fans. Oh, yeah. Dave, Dave's read every word thing... Stephen King's ever written somehow, and he's still alive. Yeah. I don't know how he did it. I'm, a, I'm only one paragraph into the Institute. That's that's I'm working on it. <laughs> You're getting there. That unique thing that Stephen does where he makes any small town anywhere in America seem like anything can happen. Yeah. I, I feel like this just, you know, I kind of already said it, but like this just made it very special. So I also felt like there was an accessibility to this film that uh, doesn't exist if he had chosen to set this. If Ryan Gosling was a Cirque du Soleil performer and uh, Bradley Cooper was working in Manhattan and Dane DeHaan and the kids were going to prep schools in Lower Manhattan in the financial district, I think this movie would have lost something for me. Right. I, I don't oh, think yeah. it would have felt as grounded. And obviously Ben Mendelsohn's char- character wouldn't have even existed and that movie would have sucked without right. Ben Mendelsohn's character. <laughs> But there is something there, that uh, well, there's, there's also that. that small town thing where like some people never make it out of their small town. Most people, yeah. And you Most they go people. from birth to death um, and their entire experience is in that one location. And uh, yeah, and, and and just to give him its due, because it really did land for me. It lands every single time, but the photograph yeah. that is like the fo- the portrait of this movie. It's the it's a lot of the portrait of, of some it's some of the portrait versions of this movie. It comes up several times. The photograph that gets taken. It's in front of this. It's it's with Ryan Gosling and um Jesus Christ. What's her name? Ava Mendez. <laughs> uh Ava Mendez and their child. And then Bradley Cooper finds it and keeps it, and then it gets revealed again at the end. So you keep saying this. So it's not just the power of the photograph. Again, that's kind of a device that can be used irresponsibly, but very specifically, it's framed in front of this tiny little ice cream shop in this town, very similar to like a small town like I grew up in. Yeah. And it's it's just such a good example that like everything you need is inside that picture. That it's small so town feel, it doesn't matter where you are. This family is sitting in the center of it. Mm. And I feel like that just came out so loudly. Yeah. So while this comments very clearly on like the issues with fathers and sons and legacy, I also think it talks about the generational problems that we have with with pride in places like America. I don't, yeah. I don't know if it's specifically America, but how do you escape the the cliches of where you came from can we even escape them i don't know i just i can't remember the last time i saw a movie that tried to really gush that. yeah sure get that <laughs> gush <laughs> i'm with you that, that was long overdue I think it's helpful to know that the, the director is from lakewood colorado which is between denver and the mountains and even though it has a population of over a hundred thousand it's in the woods and i think that works really well when you think about New York State, especially, yeah, and 
Schenectady is really near Troy and Albany, which is only a couple hours north of New York City, but it's also right next to the Adirondacks, which is basically, you know, as close to like a rainforest as the Northeast will get. And so that every town element you really get from this. And again, just yeah. the intimacy. I I, I don't want to over, ex- we, we talked a lot about act two with Bradley Cooper and, and all we've talked a lot about everything in this film. Shout out to Olga Merides, by the way, who plays um, Ava Mendez's mom, grandma, the grandma. Oh, of the baby. Um, yeah. When they show, they show this sequence, Ben Mendelsohn is the driver. Let's just put it that way. So Gosling takes the motorcycle, but they know that the motorcycle is going to be chased. So Ben Mendelsohn becomes the driver. I'll leave it at that. They have this sequence that's like 30 seconds. That's just on Ben Mendelsohn's face, driving while checking his mirrors, waiting to see if the police is coming. Now, I, we have filmmakers here, Dave and John. You guys make films. I, I do whatever you tell me to, and I hope the movie's good. And <laughs> they... I don't I don't know how you can teach this. We talked Ryan Ryan Johnson's a, a connoisseur of films. All I need is Ben Mendelssohn checking his mirrors while driving. And I'm sitting on the edge of my fucking seat and he haunts my dreams that night. So if you're watching this movie, it's very deep, it's very dark. I, I don't I don't know how to recommend when or how to watch this movie, but this is the kind of movie that if you let it, that can do that, where this guy checking his mirrors becomes it, he he enters your dreams that night. And the final frame of the movie, I know John and I, we spent a lot of time talking about this. I'm a Bon Iver fan, you're a Bon Iver fan. I watched it with subtitles this time, so I got to see the lyrics of the Bon Iver song that they play at the end of this movie. And the first lyrics are, someday my pain will mark you. And after you go through this movie about basically perpetual pain and, perpe- and systemic pain, not just systemic like yeah. like societal, but like through your family, and you're just like forced to to reiterate this unless you get really lucky and somehow can break the mold, and then someday my pain will mark you at the end of this movie. It's like she, it's it's a release. It's really it's quite a journey. This movie's a journey. Cool. Yeah. Mm. In respect to you, can, you know how to recommend watching it, I would recommend planning to watch yeah. it. Don't don't. Just flick over oh, to yeah. it on a whim. Make some time. Well said. Yeah, well said. Dude. We, we, we do kind of live in that age, don't we? Like, I never really think of it that way because I'm a weirdo. But people might want to plan to take this more seriously. If you, You're not just going to casually sit down, look at your significant other and say, what do you want to watch tonight? You might want to give this more weight. That's mm-hmm. a good, good suggestion, dude. Well, we could talk forever about this movie, but I think we should let everybody else make up their minds after that. This is also available <laughs> on Stars, And I think it's awesome. But yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's definitely it's, watch this. it's a drive. It's 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 something for sure. You can watch it in yeah. parts. You can watch like a miniseries and watch Act One one night, Act Two one night, Act Two. But just make sure you commit. don't do it though, because then you're going to lose that thing that Dave was you're talking right. about. You're right. You need that jolty thing yeah. to like really get it. Be frustrated and yeah, then get over it. Anyway, watch this fucking right, movie. We're going to come back it, with well, we need to do the random year generator, but we're going to come back soon. To talk no, about a controversial film, but let's do the let's do the random year generator. Let's Wait, do why it. aren't we doing it? No, we're doing it. Yeah, we're, we're gonna do it. We're gonna. We're yeah, gonna we're gonna do it. Gonna do it. <laughs> All right, what are we gonna watch next week, Dave? Let's see, what do we have? Oh, we have a nineteen. All right, ninety-three. Ninety-three. Oh shit. Oh yeah. Oh, I know what I'm yeah, thinking. I, 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 yeah, right. I know what I'm thinking too. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. All right, here we go. We'll see you in a second, film fans. Have a good break. And we're back! Oh, we're back. back. (laughs) Guys. We just had a surprisingly long and that was a awesome long conversation one. about films from 1993. We are so excited. I forgot that the early to mid 90s said, oh, with movies, we might have budgets to do whatever the fuck we want with movies. So there is a wide range of movies that came out in 1993. Yes. And we're so excited to announce for you which three we've chosen at the end of this segment, but we have to get to our redemption segment, or was it really that bad? Now, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, John, thank you for waiting until the middle of my speech to open your beer. (laughs) As I said at the beginning of the segment, this movie isn't necessarily considered a bad movie. It is controversial, though. So um, I I find I just find it funny that uh, Jeff hasn't noticed we've been doing that for 33 episodes. 
about the country. <laughs> okay, I, I just thought this was a, a game to make us drink too much at the end of this so that we go, we end this podcast and go back to our regular lives intoxicated since we're not in person. Um, but anyway, anyway we're yes. going gonna to talk about Prometheus, Ridley Scott, this cast. I, I'm going to get the cast right off the bat. Okay? What a cast. So you've got, so Numi Rapace is the lead of the movie and she was the original girl with the dragon tattoo in Sweden. So she had one, two, three, bang, bang, bang in Sweden. And then this was supposed to be her breakout into America. You have Michael Fassbender, who was just exploding into the American scene. He had done Inglorious Bastards in 2009. And he'd done a couple other incredible indies. And 12 Years a Slave came out not long after this. So he, he's his first guy. Not to just he's talk had about a good movie, run. he got an Oscar nomination. Anyway, <laughs> it was right on the brink of Michael Fassbender becoming an international it guy right around well i guess x-men was 2010 so it's right after x-men you have Charlize theron obviously you have idris elba who luther was out but still the american mainstream he was he was like right on the brink guy pierce was the lone like oh i've been doing this for 40 years guy you have sean harris who if you've listened to our podcast you know i will never say anything about it i love sean harris i love sean harris you have ray <gasps> spall sean harris yeah. What are you talking okay. about? <laughs> you have Rafe Spall and Benedict Wong, who you may know as Wong in Doctor Strange and the Avengers series. And then Kate Dickey, who somehow has been on this podcast a lot. She was in The Witch and she was also in Game of Thrones as Lysa Aaron. So she comes up a lot. Um, but anyway, Prometheus, Ridley Scott, here's the pitch. Uh, following clues to the origin of mankind, a team finds a structure on a distant moon. But they soon realize they are not alone. Bum, 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 bum. This movie's set in the future. I forget the year. I'm going to guess 2084. I don't know why I guessed that, but it's like in the near future. And they go, they travel to space, they're in pods, they wake up, they throw up, they've been asleep for three years, and now they're there and they are investigating <laughs> this thing. And I think that the pitch is what is Jeff Bezos doing with all of our money? <laughs> That's what they're doing, because basically a trillionaire decides to fund this space, this space mission across the, the universe instead of solving homelessness at home. I think that's basically what this movie's about, because um, they all show up and they all get out of their chambers that they've been asleep in for two and a half years. And they're about to literally land on a planet and none of them know the mission. <laughs> They all are like, so now that you're here and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. My union contract has expired. <laughs> it's like really <laughs> fucking funny. Anyway, I don't even know where to start. It's Ridley Scott. It's kind of like Alien, but it's not set on Earth. It's set really far away. Is it a prequel to Alien? I don't really know. Who wants to take it from there? I think everything I mean, he does now is a prequel to Alien, isn't it? I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Bezos wishes he was Guy Pierce's character in this movie, dude. Yeah. That is... That He's is on his dream. way. He's on his way. Um, I, uh, Dave, what do you think, dude? Yeah, I have a feeling you're going <laughs> to... You John, have all the notes. Thanks so for the input. I, ha- Good I have a lot of thoughts, but I kind of want to hear you start. Well, it's funny, like, because the thing that always threw me about this, and I've seen this uh, a lot of times, I'll always go back to it just to see, like, you know, does it get any better? Um, And <laughs> this... one thing, one thing that's already... <laughs> Like one thing that's bugged buzzed me, like or bugged me about the, this the whole time. Buzzed is, you? It buzzed you? Yeah. Something buzzed you? Did something buzz you? You want to drink your beer? How strong are those beers you're drinking, Dave? <laughs> and uh, something that's bugged me is that I like the opening scene. I never really got it, and so I thought I'm going to do a search. I'm going to do a search on yeah, the we- internet, and I can tell you now when you type that in, it's it's like typing in something that brings up. 50,000 pages of porn. There are 50,000 explanations <laughs> for what happens in the first scene of this movie on the internet, and they're all conflicting. Uh, I'm going with the their genetically seeding Earth theory because they do mention that later in the film. And once I was narrowed down on that, I had a much better time watching this film Yeah, this time around. It does have like almost as many scenery panning shots as The Hobbit, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that. Also 2012. I... <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, Jeff, I think I, I think the things you were making light of are what, what I kind of have to just allow to happen when I'm watching this movie. There are, unlike Alien, which I really like that first movie a lot, the, the tone 
of that one. I know it's set further in the future, but everyone seems to be more prepared for the situation. It seems to have a different aspect of realism to it because of the nature of the mission and the, the fact that they're all on the same page. There are a few things that pull you out of this movie that you kind of have to just let yourself be like, okay, that's all right. Like the fact that they don't know what they're going to be there doing. Um, None know, of them have a... any of idea. At, at least tell us, oh, we gave each of you $10 million to shut the fuck up. At least tell us that. At least be self-aware. I just, I need to know that you understand that this is ridiculous. That's, I just need to know that. Because I actually, I like the movie, but I, I need to know that you know. Yeah, you know no, I mean, okay, that's, sorry, that's one of the ones where he relies on the mythology more than spelling it out in the script. Because, like, these, I just need one line. these Starship crews do just sign on for a mission. They have no idea what it is half the time. They find out on the way. Um, the one they guy, find as out Sean Harris they... says, and nothing, I, I have a lot of, like, menial little lines, but I love uh, announce your profession and what your profession does line. So Sean Harris says, I'm a geologist. I deal with rocks lines in case i I don't know i i say i'm a music teacher i teach music as if that's a line that people say in real life but um like how hard is it if you can have a line like that in the movie why can't you have one line that explains how not a single person knows why they're there and i i know the movie's the movie's good (laughs) and you should be able to go with it no matter what but you can't give me a mythology thing because all i need is one sentence you you have to watch this you have to get somebody who doesn't know the mythology to watch this movie you have to do a test screening you have the money you just you just have to do it and you yeah. need somebody who says, I have no idea what's yeah, going on. Yeah, it definitely takes liberty with how much you you know. He kind of forgets that you haven't invested yourself in the alien world right. for, you know, 20 years or whatever. But the movie's fine. Even if you haven't seen Alien, and you know what? Th- these are very specific movie tropes that maybe we care about because we watch three movies a week plus. So <laughs> maybe we aren't the right people to talk about that specific thing as far as like, who would like this movie? I think there's some fun. There's a lot of fun sci-fi things in here, but there's always he- fun sci-fi thing. Th- this is my only, this is my only criticism about Ridley Scott is that that man is clearly capable of making really wonderful films. Like he's, he knows how to make movies. Yeah. And yet in all of his movies, and I, I know that's a broad brush, but I think I'm going to say it. I think all of his movies have some moments and scenes that make you remember that you're in a movie, whether it's cheesy dialogue or just the way he cut together a certain sequence, it just feels like it's uh, it, it, it feels a little forced. Like it needed to be in there to present this information so that you can get to the next kick-ass sequence. Um, I think my best example of that for this is twofold. That first scene when you meet uh, Harris's character, when he says, I'm only in it here to make money. It's like, wow, square into a round hole. Like there was probably two more lines that would have been necessary to make that feel a little bit more organic. And then it immediately goes to another scene um, where, uh, what's her name? The two protagonists, uh, Naomi Rapace and um, the guy who plays Charlie, Logan Marshall Green, have a very human exchange with each other. And then they give this presentation, which again, feels a little forced. So sometimes I feel like his movies go back and forth between like a realistic version of humanity and a movie. Mm-hmm. And then in, interspersed in, in that kind of thing are unbelievable visual sequences yeah, that sure. are very like, oh my God, I'm in the hands of a master. And yet, sometimes I do feel like he falls into a trap. The last 20 minutes of this movie are three different endings. And I, I think he I think he fell into his own hole where on script, I understand when he said green light, let's fucking do it. I bet on the page he was like, I can make those sequences in so that it has enough momentum to push you all the way through to the end. And then he's so good at the filmmaking stuff. He might be too good that he gets so excited about the visual effects that those three sequences turn into three ultimate obstacles for her, his protagonist. And she ends up dealing with three things that feel like three different endings. So I feel like it does lose a little bit of steam towards the end, even though I'm still captivated the entire time because he's such a good yeah. fucking filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the ending... That's always how I feel. The ending was the uh, the trailer for the franchise, basically. Yeah. And they did not get picked up, but... Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, they, they, made, they made one more, and he, he went even more out there on it. Like, we yeah. actually... It, the the funny thing Covenant is, like, 2017. We, uh, we watched this today, and I was like, I want to I wanna watch Covenant again and give it another Covenant? look. Covenant? How yeah, was it? I haven't uh, seen well, it. You, no, you can't stream that anywhere either at the moment. Oh. 
You so can't even rent it? You can rent it, but you can't stream it. And I'm like, I'm not paying for Covenant. Fuck that. <laughs> it's not worth it. Because I thought about doing it tonight because I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot they made an- another one of these. Yeah. You're telling me not to, though? You're turning me down? Um, No, give. I mean, give it a watch if you haven't seen it. I have. <laughs> but Thanks uh, for the recommendation, I'll, Dave. I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, this in this film and, and also like in all the alien films, the pro- like the production design of everything is amazing. Like these, yeah. some of the, these ships that they come out with in these, Alien these, are yeah, some of my yeah. favorite fucking starships ever. I love when they do those really gigantic shots. You know that they, they kind of started yeah. in house back to two thousand one, um, but it's like the ship is just tiny in the midst of this massive fucking location yeah. or this massive. When they first universe. get to the planet, right? Yeah, and David opens the uh, unbelievable. I know. Yeah. It's- yeah, that and that the high school the high school play version of it in New Jersey, fucking awesome. <laughs> I remember <Shut> that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are a few things that I feel like he was like Ridley Scott clearly loves movies. Yeah, and and it's obvious. There is a moment at the beginning, and they dropped it. Did you guys notice this? Uh, Michael Fassbender's character's name is Dave. Am I right? It's David. David, yeah. David. And there is a computer who speaks to him while he is awake, while everyone else is in hypersleep, and it is the yeah. exact voice from 2001. And he's like, I'm sorry, Dave. I can't do that. I was like, come on. Like, <laughs> Even though I like that you're giving me the illusion, yeah. and I love that he's watching Lawrence of Arabia, and the, when he brings the quote back, there was nothing in the desert and no man needs nothing. Yeah. Like it's meaningful. But sometimes again, I feel like he kind of kind of falls into his own traps of the movie thing. And his movies feel like movies. I think and this is a I feel like this movie is a perfect example of that because he kind of leaned into that 100 percent And it didn't quite go into a shameless factor for me, where I felt like I was kind of watching Ridley Scott's like give me a break let's watch an alien movie i think yeah. he still wanted us to mm. take this seriously but he kept messing with those tropes and it, i kept getting I think, pulled out of it what i mean you guys I, think, think? I think the biggest problem is like every single instance of the alien franchise and this was theoretically meant to be an alien prequel uh that's yeah. what they build it as but every instance of the alien fran- fran- franchise ripley in the first one beats the monster puts herself in the pod story's resolved on off she goes she may survive she may not like off they go the second one starts with her being found. She gets in the situation again. They yeah. beat it. They nuke the planet. They get in the pod. Off they go. And resolve. Nuke the planet. We've we've fi- we've finished. Well, we've nuke finished the planet, it. Yada yada yada. And uh, you know, on. as you do. And uh, but <laughs> in this one, it was a case of like they got in the situation. They killed the alien and then got in a ship. Saying, but they set up this whole mystery about where they're going next they're not yeah. just going off and so, like they didn't leave it like i feel like this needed an, an ambiguous ending to the point where it's like okay we've got a ship or something they could have stopped it there and left that is, whole last sequence out for me i I, yeah. I completely agree with you and and we're being part of this movie again this movie's not that bad if you watch it no, it's you just fun. watch it it's good time yeah i wrote i wrote down definitely the um the David planetarium sequence is what I called it, which is when Michael Fassbender has that little globe thing. And it, yep. it looks like Most expensive in, shot in the film. I mean, it has to be. Oh, yeah. sure. it, Beautiful. It, it feels Fucking like you're gorgeous. in it's like a hundred million the, polygons in that thing. What, what's the thing? What's the, in the, um, the natural Orrery? history museum, the, yeah, um, in, in New York, oh, that, you have that, the planetarium, the famous planet, mm-hmm. the hated planetarium. The planetarium. It, <laughs> it, it feels like it's something that should be in there. Yeah. Um, but I wish that was in there. I, I you know it's, I, I I don't want to speak to really Scott or really any director's intentions because everybody's intention is to make a good film. So I don't want to pretend like I can speak to their intentions, but I wrote down, I, I kept writing this thing down. I wrote up, oh, here comes Chekhov's Medipod, which is a medical pod. It's like, this is a medical pod. What does this do? Oh, it does this. And I was like, I bet this is going to come up in the film. And then they, they decided not to bring the weapons into the planet. They literally know nothing about because they accepted the mission sight on things like no that terms things and like that like, dude no this is a science expedition don't bring the weapons and it's like the safety is gonna be on i don't plan on using the weapons 
but I don't know where I am right now because I just found out about this mission ten minutes ago. So these mm. things that yeah. here, no, but here's doesn't the, here's sound the, like a doesn't sound like well, a trillion dollar mission decision. But here's it? my here's my point. Here's my point. <laughs> I pride our podcast on being a positive film podcast, obviously, but also that we are feeling first. Uh, part of the reason we started this podcast is we hated critics. I hated critics. I think you agreed that just they, the way they're talking, their feelings had nothing to do with what they were saying. They were just like, this film did this blank, blank, blank. And it was like, but what did you, did you like the movie? You know what I mean? The movie was fine. I felt okay about this movie, but things like don't bring your weapons in, you know, you're in a, we, we, we just talked about Ryan Johnson and Derek. I'm going to mess up his name. Chian French who had the audience they, they they knew what they were doing to the audience the whole time Ridley Scott is a brilliant filmmaker Alien and then you have Aliens he worked with James Cameron through the whole series like this is a brilliant filmmaker and he doesn't care about the alien here he, is, he, he doesn't care sorry he doesn't care about the human he doesn't care about the audience here don't bring your weapons onto the strange planet that you don't know anything about this is this goes back to Dark Knight Rises with like don't do that to us like, okay, if you want people to be, no, just bring the weapons and have whatever's out there beat the weapons. Like, don't, don't not bring the weapons. That's just stupid. The audience is going to watch this movie and go, that's stupid. Every single time. It, it's just the truth. So the reason that he does that, yeah. stupid, tiny, these are tiny, tiny decisions that make your brilliant filmmaking ability turn into a problematic film. Like, like literally like that one decision immediately takes your film from an A and the highest it can possibly be is a B plus. Cause you completely, made a dude, I completely agree. These, and these are, this is why like, all right, we're talking about art here. We're talking about cinema. So like, let's only, let's only focus on that. But I think it applies to all sorts of different aspects of life. There are principles that have relativity to them, but the principles are important. You are not supposed to solve characters, obstacles for them. That's a perfect right. example. That is one of those moments where I was like, why did you even have to comment on that? You could have solved that problem visually, cinematically, and I know he's got the fucking skills to do it because he's a goddamn genius. Yeah. I wanted to see them struggle with the fact that their weapons, whatever, didn't work, were, were overcompensated, or you know something, something beat them. There were a million ways that they could have solved that problem without fucking talking about it in a tiny little pre-meeting. Oh, are you bringing that gun with you? So there's there are there are too many moments like that in this movie for me to question like it just confuses me sometimes when when Ridley Scott like does things like that because I know he's capable of doing more than that and I just don't know where that fucking shit comes from he didn't write the screenplay I, no, I Damon, don't know who Damon Lindelof these of Lost <laughs> co-wrote the screenplay well that yeah. explains yeah. it because um, ultimately <laughs> where does this country let's talk about this really fast let's get into it where does the controversy for this film come from within the alien fan universe i think it comes from the the discrepancy over how the aliens actually came into existence and whether or not there was enough kick kick-ass action in this movie to justify the birth of the last 15 seconds of this mm. movie I mean, where yeah, you I get to finally awesome. see this thing i can give you two good examples people went in expecting an alien film and they got a highbrow sci-fi action about a man search about man's search for his origins and accept, obsession with immortality instead. Yeah, and that wasn't what they went in there for. So it was kind of like a broken promise. And also, the protagonist, who the protagonist is, is actually confusing because I, I don't know if you if you watch this really closely. Ding ding the ding, ding ding. The protagonist is David. Wait, I was okay. Dave, get out of my notes. Dave, get out of my notes. <laughs> Dave, I think you're a narcissist for for believing that. First of all, wait, just because <laughs> John, Dave, John, Dave, and I are sharing notes really quick. You're totally right. You're totally right. Get in there, Dave. So I wrote this, which I'm sure I imagine you agree based on what you said. I said the only three dimensional character is the robot. <laughs> no, I don't agree. You're a fucking <laughs> get the fuck out of here. I no, yeah, I, I know I Numi, Numi Rapace is so yeah. close to being three dimensional, but she's not Ridley. So what is it that separates Ridley and Numi Rapace? Is something to think about. The other thing I would say is this: there are basically. I, I hate platitudes, so I hate when somebody's like, there's two types of people in this world, but there's really two ways of approaching sci-fi. One is we discover <laughs> everything with the characters. So the characters right. don't know anything and we discover with them. The other way is they know everything, but the audience isn't told it, so we have to play catch up as they go along. Mm. This movie is the first. They don't know anything. So what, what you said is like, this is about man's quest. You're right. And they do say that later in the movie. And actually, that's a really, that's such a good idea. But Numi Rapace and her husband are not three-dimensional when they introduce that. So I don't care about it yet. What do you think about that thought? Do you 
let me ask, let me throw this question in there too, so we can stir around with it. Do you think we were supposed to have David's point of view the entire time and really no, just no? We were of, supposed to have Numi's. We were supposed to have Numi's. You so you're you're you think we were because I'm I'm not sure to be honest with you. This is my second time seeing this, and I'm not quite. She is literally the first point of view we have. Yeah. First shot is her banging in that cave, or the, after the little uh, beginning prologue. First shot is her. So I know what you mean. It seems like we're supposed to be following her, and she is clearly in our view most of the movie. I mean, but David is the only one that we actually get to see thinking. She acts. David thinks. So I'm not quite sure. What yeah, do you think, I mean, in, in 2001, you see the apes, and they're not the protagonists of the film. True. True. Good point. But, but like, so it, talk to me about a lead, it's a device to get them to the point. I think this whole thing. Do you think there were two protagonists? Him. I mean, do you think there are two might, because they, they end up going together at yeah, the end? Yeah, it's possible. But I think this this whole movie was more about he focused more on the androids' journey than the alien because I know he's specifically said in, in interviews he wanted to get away from the aliens and nobody responded to that. that's why they're back in the the second one all right then this is why then this is why it didn't completely succeed for me if, if that was what he was trying to do because he didn't give I, I know this might sound obvious but because he didn't give the android any kind of ultimate conflict other than getting his head ripped off <laughs> Then, then it kind of stopped for me when that happened. I was kind of like, what the fuck are we going to do now Now that David, now that they're <laughs> conduit between the aliens and them, he just got ripped in half. And then he just comes back kind of magically. He just starts talking to yeah. her again. What is his energy source? Three sequences later. What is his energy source? Yeah, like source? how the fuck is he communicating Who's powering to him? him? Is his power center actually in his head and not his body? Did he need his body Yeah, because when they did the same thing to Bishop, she had to wire him up. Like she had to power him but for see, to do that. I know, but, but see... But see, that would have bothered me less had he been communicating the entire time. Is the fact that we left him and we went with just her. Mm. I thought he was. I thought that was the moment where he was going to start to meld the two protagonists. And yet we left him and we went just with her. And then he just comes back very safely and comfortably at the very end. Look out. He's coming to get you right when the alien was coming to attack her. It was a little too perfect. And it gave me that same feeling like, all right, I'm watching a movie. Because if he had been speaking to her the entire time and he was actually... I know this is a trope with sci-fi, but when it's pulled off, it's pulled off well. If he had been speaking to her the entire time because he was actually afraid he was going to die or that he wasn't going to get out of that that ship that he was buried in, there would have been some kind of thing that would have brought them together instead of just function. They mm. got together because of function, which didn't yeah. do it for me. I don't know. What yeah, you, I mean, sorry, I, going dominated. back to what, what Jeff said, there are, there are only two types of people in the world. And he's right. The the, there are two types of people in the world. There are people that just run in a straight line and people that turn right and run out from in front of the fucking thing that's about to fall on them. Mm. Is that a Game yeah. of Thrones throwback to the Battle of the Bastards? No, I, I mean, but no, honestly, it's, 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 a, it's one of the, and it's one of the, yeah, it's Dave, one of the, you one of the biggest like controversies that, in this film. Yeah, Dave, yeah. when you see shit like that, are you like, because I mean, again, the visual effects are astounding. Yeah. Like everything that's happening in that yeah. sequence is just like, motherfucker, this guy is a pro. Ship, and yet he puts something in. I mean, but then he they, puts a sequence they, in there like that where you're like, give they me do a justify break, it dude, in, are you kidding in me? explaining, like they justified it later in discussions by explaining that like some people in, in those situations do just blindly panic and run in a straight direction. They don't have the plan making skills when they panic. But if you have to go back and explain something after your movie, after it's been ridiculed, you you failed. Yeah. Yeah. And doesn't she? And does it? Didn't they literally have her say the line? This is Charlie Theron's character. We're talking about people, uh, Vickers. Vickers. Yeah. She literally says the line early on. Um, I take every precaution for safety. Or she's like, because yeah. she has, she lives in like a lifeboat. Yeah. So there, there, it was like a contradiction that I didn't think quite. I don't know. I think there are too many mo- too many moments in that in this movie where. You feel people are contradicting themselves for the sake of visual spectacle that that keeps it from being a great movie, but it's mm-hmm. still fun. And if you like the alien world and the alien franchise, I don't I agree with you, Dave. I think he ended up making more of a dramatic kind of take on the human saga of trying to figure out where we came from, but it's yeah. still worth watching. I it's think unbelievably so gorgeous. Yeah. And I still feel like the acting is fantastic. There's it's a really brutal med pod scene in the middle of it. But my, I think my yeah. biggest takeaway from this is if you're on my exploration team, you're watching this as the safety video. Yeah. <laughs> Do not take oh your helmet gosh. off and don't poke the fucking alien snakes. That's that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't take your fucking helmet off, dude. Yes, yes. They weren't worried about pathogens at all. Like, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Um, I don't know you guys. 
Yeah, this guy's a scientist that literally traveled across the solar system over three years <laughs> and in 30 seconds went, what are the oxygen levels? This helmet's coming off. Yeah. I can't even take my helmet off now during COVID and the air is fine outside. He's a helmet Get denier. The- <laughs> He's a helmet denier. Anyway, all right. Any Jeff, final you're thoughts? totally right, dude. Any uh, final thoughts? I mean, one piece of wisdom when the android starts quoting philosophy, everybody the fuck out of the pool. Yeah. And if you're a scientist... Your scientist, every decision he makes is with his dick. He's a terrible scientist, and he didn't go to school for science because he's not a scientist. <laughs> Come on with that. He's like, oh, what are the oxygen levels? Mask off. What about, un- what, how do you, you're in a foreign space station. What if they can't even detect? It doesn't matter. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. No, no, no. Not the, the well. reason, You're right. Yeah. yeah you're what what right. I would take away from our podcast is the, th- the things that tear us apart the most are movies that are so close. Because just bad movies we don't care about and, and good movies are easy. So it's like the reason we're saying all this stuff is because like, it's anyway. We we, we I we, I don't have the answers. You don't. I do have, the have one final one final criticism. How did they not show us Idris Elba and Charlie Theron having sex? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that would have been. Like, <laughs> come on, are you kidding me? <laughs> that would have been incredible. We didn't get to see any of this, that. It's not Family Guy. It's not like oh, we need some boobs. And it's like there are boobs. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We got a movie. We got a movie. <laughs> yeah. No. no. <laughs> it's not no, the Age of Innocence. It's not the Age of Innocence. <laughs> All right. Anyway, also 1993, <laughs> which is our segue into. The next week's podcast here. So again, in two weeks, I messed up on my time frame here, but on Halloween night, which is a Saturday, what's it? October 31st. October 31st. How strong are your beers? <laughs> we're going to talk. We're going to do a live stream. We're going to have a special it's, it's guest. A, isn't this Sunday? Oh. Anyway, next podcast, we'll, we'll give you more about it. Follow us on Facebook if you want to know more. But we're going to do a live Halloween episode. No, Halloween is a Saturday, so it's John. You, I hope you're, you have this marked you're, in your calendar because you you said you'd be there. It's the early voting. I'm, I'm just throwing off. I'm helping so much, you know. All I right. Well, it's <laughs> what, the polls will be closed by the time we do this podcast. Anyway, um, next week, 1993, we are not doing the Age of Innocence, which we just teased, but we are doing three fantastic films. First film we're doing is The Fugitive, which you have to rent. It is not available for streaming services. Then, Dave, what are we doing next? <laughs> We're doing the Nightmare Before Christmas. Fuck yeah, which is on Disney you Plus. Forget, Disney Plus. you forget the other time. It's on Disney Plus. And then the third film we're doing, our redemption film, or was it really that bad? We are doing The Last Action Hero with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh. Come on, baby. We are doing The Last Action Hero, which is available on Stars. Stars. Fuck yeah, nailed it. All right, Stars. people. This has been a fantastic episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Any final thoughts, guys? John, not you. Dave? Well, we've said enough. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. We will see you next week.